Rewind. <laughs> I won't say the prayer again. The story we hear over the past few weeks and today is the story of Sarah and Abraham. And this story, although it might not be on any of the summer reading lists, is a long saga. It is epic. If it were a movie, it would be like Gone with the Wind. We have Sarah and Abraham, like Scarlett O'Hara and Clark Gable. Oops, I just combined. Like Scarlett O'Hara and Vivian Lee and Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> I got it right that time. It's the kind of story that has its ups and its downs, its drama, its beauty, also its ugliness. And the truth of the matter is, if it were a movie, what we hear on Sunday mornings is just a trailer, a teaser, tiny bits and pieces of the story. A recap two weeks ago, we started this story by hearing about Abram. Abram, to whom God appeared and said, go from this place, I will make of you a great nation. And Abram, that great model of our faith, the one we looked to, trusted God, had no idea what the future held, had no idea what would happen, but took God at God's word and went, left behind his family, left behind his land, took Lot, his nephew, and their households, and went the model of faith. That's all in chapter 12 of Genesis. And what we didn't read on Sunday morning, just after that, was when Abram came to Egypt. They came to Egypt, and what did he do? Well, he was a little worried that if Pharaoh saw his beautiful wife, Sarai, that he would want the wife and would kill Abram. And so he passed off his wife as a sister. And Sarai ended up in the Pharaoh's household for a while. Our great model of faith. Not so trusting of God at this time. Well, God found out and God struck the people of Egypt. And eventually, Pharaoh found out why all the adversity had come their way. It was because of Sarai. And Sarai was let go, and she and Abram moved on. That's all in chapter 12. I'm going to skip over 13 and 14. A little teaser, it has to do with Lot, the nephew, mostly. But then we come to chapter 15, still again not heard on a Sunday morning, and Abram is getting a little bit impatient. And Abram says to God, who appears to them, appears to him, okay, I still don't have an offspring. You haven't sent a son my way, God. And God says to him, do not be afraid, Abram. Do not be afraid. Look at the stars. Those will be your descendants, more than the stars in the sky. And then in chapter 16, enters supporting actress, Hagar. Hagar, a servant girl, a servant of Sarah, is in her household. It's Sarah's, Sarai's idea to take Hagar, give her as a wife to her own husband, Abram, so
so that an heir can come from Hagar. So he does it. He does it. Abram takes Hagar. <laughs> if you're following, you can tell I'm trying to follow along too. And indeed, Hagar becomes pregnant. Abram is expecting a child. But immediately, Sarai, our heroine in the story, supposedly turns on Hagar. Or maybe it's Hagar who started gloating about the fact that she was expecting a baby and Sarai could not. Said Sarai, she looks on me with contempt. Says Hagar, she treats me harshly. And so again, this is back in 16. We don't hear about this on Sunday morning. She runs away. She run, runs away from the household of Abram and Sarai and ends up out in the wilderness. And it is there that Hagar hears the voice of God. Some would say she's the only one of three. There are only three women in the whole Bible to whom God speaks directly. Often God uses angels, the angel Gabriel that came to Mary, for example. And she, along with Eve and Rebecca, in case you're wondering who the other two are, was addressed directly by God. And what did God tell her? God said, you will bear a son and your son will be a father of nations. And then that line where Hagar names the God, names the unnameable, El Roy, the one who sees. God saw her in the wilderness. God saved her. And God sends her back, back to Abram and Sarah. There, she has her baby, and Abram names it Ishmael. Now, chapter 17 is a pivotal one because it is here that God comes again to Abram and speaks of the covenant, nails it down, if you will. I will be your God, and you will be my people. There will be a sign. The sign is circumcision. At this point, all the males are circumcised. And the other sign or symbol is that Sarah and Abram become Sarah and Abraham. They are given a new name, this new promise. Chapter 18. Last week, I won't quiz anybody on what happened. If you were here or not, or remember. But last week, that beautiful scene, and it's familiar to us, under the oaks of Mamre, when the three angelic visitors come to Sarah and Abraham, and once again, through these angels, they're told that they will have a son. Apparently not Ishmael, the son through Hagar, but that Sarah, in her old age, will bear a son. And Sarah famously laughs. I'll skip chapter 19, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Beginning of chapter 20, Isaac is born. God's promise has been fulfilled. Abram is a hundred years old. Sarah, around 90, and the heir apparent is here. And that brings us to today. Today, when Sarah looks on, sees Ishmael and Isaac playing together, worries about the fact that Ishmael might share in the inheritance, and asks Abraham to send them away. 
They are sent away. They end up again in the wilderness, hungry, thirsty, and once again, God saves them, sending them water. Stay tuned for next week. I'll leave that one to Simon. So how is this saga, this epic story of Sarah and Abraham, God's word for us this morning? Not just the chosen bits of model faithfulness, but the other parts woven in when the faith wasn't too strong. Well, first of all, I think it would be accurate to say that God chooses very unlikely candidates for God's purposes in the world. We like to talk about the faith of Abraham. We refer to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as the Abrahamic faiths. But God used Abraham even in his lack of trust. I forgot to mention the other time he passed Sarah off as his sister. It happened more than once. But still, God used them. Used them for God's purposes. A prime example of that is the disciples. It's often looked at specifically in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, but true across the boards, that they never quite get it. They misunderstand who Jesus is. They think that he's going to be a military messiah one moment. They don't understand the next. Why he's dining with tax collectors and sinners? Does he know these people he's hanging out with? Of course, they then forsake him. Peter betrays him. And today, we hear that Jesus is sending them out nonetheless. If there's anything Sarah and Abraham tell us, it's that we don't need to be perfect. We don't need to be perfectly faithful or trusting in God for God to use us for God's purposes in the world. Secondly, the compilers of this story in the book of Genesis told us the whole story. They could easily have just kind of written out this part about Hagar, a kind of distasteful chapter in the story of their hero. But instead, they tell the whole story, the whole story of mistakes, of misleadings, as well as successes. So it is with us as we tell our stories, too. One could argue that the lectionary compilers, the people that put together our readings for Sunday mornings, we're doing a little bit of editing, taking out the less savory parts. But certainly that's true of us as communities and as individuals, too. That we are afraid that people won't accept us if we tell them the more unsavory parts of our own lives. True, too, for a community of people as we tell our story of our country, of our community, there are certainly times when we were the privileged or the oppressors. There are times when we paid lip service to reconciliation and justice, and yet often unknowingly, not meaning to be so. We're not advocates for justice in our own lives, in our own history. Sarah and Abraham's story tells us we can tell our whole story. Look with honest eyes at our whole truth. 
And finally, I circle around to the children's moment now. Our God is the God who sees, who sees everything, who sees all those times in our lives when we do wrong, when we do things we wish we hadn't left other things undone, when we do the right things for the wrong reasons. God sees us individually, as a community, as we do the best we can. And nonetheless, God, God sees us and loves us, loves us and sends us out to do God's work. That is the good news. God's word for us today. Amen.